from the anatomy of the kidney. Uh, there are two kidneys in each person. You have one left, you have one right. They're located in the posterior part of the abdominal cavity, located on, uh, on each side of the spine. Uh, because of the anatomical position of the liver, the right kidney tends to lay a little bit lower than the left one. The left one is slightly higher, it's also a little bit more medial and bigger. Uh, the kidneys are protected by the 11th and the 12th ribs, and their size range between 9 to 13 centimeters in diameter. Um, one of the most important functions of the kidneys is that they make up the urinary system. What you have your renal, vein, and artery, you've got the kidneys, you have the urine, the bladder, and the urethra. First, um, let us go over the vascular supply to the kidney. Uh, you have your abdominal aorta, which comes down, and then you have your renal artery, and that breaks up into segmental artery, lobar artery, interlobar artery, and then arcuate. And then if you wanted to go into more detail, you go into the nephrons, which are actually located within this pyramid shape, and they're called peritubular capillaries. I'll be going into a little bit more detail with that in a moment. But first, I'd like to show you the layers of the kidney. You have the renal cortex, which is the outer layer, and then you have the medulla, which makes up the inner medulla and also the outer medulla. In the cortex, usually you'll have the proximal and the distal convoluted uh, tubules uh, because the nephrons, where they tend to arrive, they come down and then they come back up. So in the upper portion, you're going to have the proximal and distal tubules, you're going to have the inferred efferent arterioles, and Within the, uh, within the cortex in the ascending and descending limb of the Henle. In the medulla, in the outer zone, you'll have the thicker portions of the loop of Henle, the descending and the ascending. And then when you get into the inner medulla, that will mainly consist of the thin portions of the loop of Henle, which is descending, it comes around, and then it comes back up. I'll show that to you in a moment. The interlobal arteries then go into first detail to the peritubular catheter. Now here's a pyramid on one of the kidneys. It has a magnifying a little bit more. A little bit more you can actually see how the nephrons make up the kidney. Uh, there's approximately 1.2 to 1.3 nephrons <coughs> per kidney. They are the unit of the kidney. So here's the cortex, which is the outer layer of the kidney. Here's the medulla. This could be called the cortical nephron. This could be called the juxtamedullary nephron. Uh, you've got the arteries, the veins, uh, the tertiary capillaries, and one other important thing here is the collecting duct. The collecting duct comes up and you've got numerous neurons that will connect to it, getting rid of the waste that are in the body. Okay, so the aper arterial would be the renal. And then you have the heparin arterial. Balance capsule of this entire projection right here. And inside here, you have a glomerulus, which is basically a bunch of uh, arteries or capillaries that come together to get the filtration into the nephron. And then you have the proximal loop of memory, which is thick. And then you have the ascending loop, which is thin, ascending, which is thin. And then you have the Distal cobular tubule, which is a thick portion, which then leads into the collecting duct. Here's a picture of the glomerular capillary. You have the efferent arterial, your apron arterial. You have your macular dental cells, which play a different role. I'll go to that in a moment. And then here's the proximal tubule, and that's pretty much the beginning of the actual nephron before you get into the descending. Okay, blood filtering. Um, the kidneys filter approximately 200 liters of fluid on a daily basis, and they also produce about 2 liters of urine on a daily basis. Uh, their main purpose is for the excretion of waste products, excretion of nitrogenous waste produced by metabolism. Um, you're producing urea, you're producing uric acid from the plague acid breakdown. The urea has got to get rid of that because it's toxic to the body. It plays a role in homeostasis, um, and I'd rather talk about whole body homeostasis because you have to have acid-base regulation, which kidneys decide 
how they're going to either create or reabsorb hydrogen within the tubules. Uh, you have blood pressure. Uh, the kidneys play a major role in blood pressure. Um, you can talk about renin, in which that increases blood pressure through a very particular mechanism, which I'm going to go into more detail, but you also have aldosterone, which reaches uh, the distal popular of the tubule and reabsorbs sodium back into the vascular network, which increases your blood pressure. Uh, plasma volume, which you have uh, any increase or decrease in plasma volume, that's usually detected by the hypothalamus. And what the hypothalamus does is it, produce, it produces a hormone antidiuretic hormone, which is secreted into the posterior pituitary. And then when the hypothalamus secretes it, when it senses that you have a low volume or high volume, it will then release the antidiuretic hormone to the distal popular tubule, and you're going to reabsorb water. Um, hormone secretion, erythropoid, um, can play a major role in maintaining the red blood cell when there's no blood. Um, in the event that uh, your blood is hypoxic, the kidneys can detect that, and what they'll do is they'll release erythropoid, which is an effector, and that travels to the bone marrow to start a erythropoiesis and produce red blood cells. Um, another one I meant to put in here was urodicin, which uh, increases renal blood flow. And it does that because it, 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 it's able to deduct that there's an increase in renal arterial pressure within the, the renal vein and also an increase in volume. So that's also secreted. Okay. Um, I know that we've talked about hydrostatic pressure and narcotic pressure. And in physiology, that also comes into play when we talk about the nephron. Uh, the proximal portion of the nephron is, is pretty much um, it's able to absorb sodium, chlorine, magnesium, bicarbonate, um, and it's at an osmotic pressure of 300, and it gradually increases and it goes down to, in order to create that gradient for the fluid within the nephron to flow. Uh, so then you have the descending limb, a loop of Henle, which is permeable to H2O, and then when you go ascending on the loop of it's not impermeable to H2O. It's only again permeable at the visceral popular tubule and also the collecting duct. Then you also have sodium chloride, potassium, magnesium, bicarbonates that, that can be reabsorbed into the blood or put into the nephrons to get rid of. Um, Brennan and King, uh, angiotensin and aldosterone system. Um, angiotensin is produced in the liver, transported in the blood. The macrolytic <coughs> cells of the kidney, which are located on the, um, which are located on the distal portion of the tubule, that 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 the macrolytic cells are responsible for producing renin. And whenever there's a increase or decrease in blood pressure, the renin is released into the blood system. Uh, the renin then meets with angiotensin and it converts to angiotensin 1. Uh, you have angiotensin converting enzyme which is produced in small amounts within the lungs. That comes out and converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And, and, and with regard to angiotensin 2, that then causes vasoconstriction which increases your blood pressure. It also acts on the hypothalamus, or the adrenal the adrenal gland rather, rather to produce aldosterone secretion in which you're going to have reabsorption of sodium and water at the distal tubule. And the ADH is responsible for the reabsorption of water. Uh, different clinical aspects, kidney stones are very painful, neurological disorders. Uh, there's really no link to how they actually occur, they just occur, sometimes they're hereditary. Uh, they found in a 7,000-year-old mummy that he had a kidney stone. Um, it can be linked to hyperthyroidism. It can also be linked to urinary tract infection, um, hereditary and inherited disorder. Um, two of them that I can talk about would be cystinuria, in which your body produces too much of the amino acid cysteine. And when you have too much cysteine within the blood, that enters into the kidney that ends up in the nephron. In the nephron, it does not dissolve, so it creates a stone system. Um, you also have hypercalciuria, uh, in which your body is taking out too much calcium from the metabolism, 
it all arrives into Google's and Nephron, and in a way you get calcium oxalate, calcium, calcium phosphate, which is a, a kidney stone as well. That can occur in the kidney, it can also occur anywhere in the urinary tract. That's called the kidney uh, stone. And the way that they, they treat that is they pretty much tell you to go home, drink three quarts of water, take a lot of painkillers, and, and if that doesn't work, if the stone is too big, what we'll do is we'll do surgery. Uh, the chronic syndrome, which is a large protein loss uh, within the urine, that usually is associated with a decreased amount of albumin within the blood. Um, that also will result in having a high cholesterol level and having swelling. Uh, chronic kidney disease. Okay. First, I'm talking about kidney failure before I talk about chronic kidney disease. Chronic uh, kidney failure is when you have partial loss of the, uh, the, the ability of the kidney to work at a normal rate. And basically, if it doesn't work in a normal fashion, you're not going to be able to get rid of the toxins in your body. That can result in acidosis, that can result in increased high blood pressure, you can have too much volume build up. Um, and then chronic kidney disease is pretty much a progressive uh, disorder in the kidney. Um, basically, it goes by the glomerular filtration rate, and there are five stages. Uh, it can be basically not too bad. It can be mild, moderate, severe. Or kidney failure. <coughs> the the glomerular filtration rate is based on milliliters per minute. This would be at a rate of 90 milliliters per minute. This would be at a rate of 50, uh, 60, 89, and 30, and 59. And 15 to 30, and anything less, or anything less than 15 milliliters per milliliter a minute through the glomerular uh, filtration rate, that's when you have kidney disease and chronic failure. And either you need to get a kidney transplant or go through dialysis. And dialysis is simple; basically creates some negative electrochemical electro gradient where you can actually get the flow of the fluid through a dialyzer, which is a semi-permeable membrane, and it basically is an, uh, an artificial way of replacing the kidney. So, that's my presentation.